Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. My name is Lyndon Nugent, and welcome to the LBJ Library. We have a wonderful program here, courtesy of the LBJ Presidential Library in Humanities, Texas. But first, a couple of small points. The first is that, as most of you know, Lyndon Johnson was committed to educating the people of this country. He got his start as a poor school teacher in rural South Texas, and he championed the funding of elementary, secondary, and higher education throughout his presidency. When questioned about the high cost of education, LBJ would frequently reply, if you think education is expensive, you should see the cost of ignorance. Now, our program tonight is an opportunity to do just that, to help educate the people of America. It is a great, wonderful, interactive program that this library has put on for many years because it brings us all together with an opportunity to visit with and listen to people that had the direct making and the direct carrying out of so many policies that have impacted this country. In addition, we get to spend an evening with a real American hero, and you simply cannot put a price tag on that. Now, for the second one, tonight's program tonight could not have taken place without the hard work of one man, and that is Mr. Mike Gillette. Mike has been a great friend of this library for many years. He currently serves as the Director of Humanities Texas and is an advisor to the John Glenn School of Public Affairs. But speaking for myself and Mark Updegrove, the director here at the library, our guest tonight is one of our childhood heroes, and we are both profoundly grateful to Mike Gillette for making this possible. Ladies and gentlemen, Mike Gillette. Thank you. I'm honored to be here. I feel a little bit like the, the guy that wandered through the wrong door and ended up on stage, however. <laughs> Humanities Texas is the state affiliate of the National Endowment for the Humanities, another legacy of President Johnson's great society. We work with schools, libraries, and museums to advance heritage, culture, and education. And we're particularly proud to work with the LBJ Library frequently in conducting workshops for classroom teachers. Catherine Robb is a member of our board of directors, I'm pleased to say. The Smithsonian's Air and Space Museum attracts eight to 10 million tourists a year. And when you enter that majestic building, you encounter the milestones of flight, those celebrated breakthroughs that really charted the aviation history of this country. The Wright Brothers 1903 flyer that rose above the dunes at the Kitty Hawk, the spirit of St. Louis that carried Charles Lindbergh across the ocean in 1927, and the Friendship 7 capsule in which John Glenn became the first American to orbit the Earth in 1962. Uh, these venerable icons, artifacts, are some of the most treasured uh, of, our, of our nation's history because they carried the men who bore this nation's hopes and dreams of conquering sky and space. But tonight we have not merely the conveyance, but the man himself, half a century after his historic flight. The son of a Ohio plumber, a combat pilot in uh, World War II in Korea, and uh, one of the first original uh, Mercury uh, astronauts after he had been a test pilot in the 1950s. He had 10 years in uh, private business before being elected to the United States Senate from Ohio, and he served as a senator from Ohio for a quarter century. And then, as we all know, he went back into space aboard the uh, shuttle discovery in 1998. His latest mission has been to encourage young people to become engaged in civic life and public service through his work on the John Glenn School of Public Affairs. 
And you should know that when he start, first started thinking about this, his first stop was the LBJ School of Public Affairs to see what was happening here. And leading the conversation with Senator John Glenn is that world-class interviewer, our host, and my friend, Mark Updegrove. So please join me in welcoming former Senator John Glenn and Mark. Thank you. Have you Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, Senator, welcome. We are honored to have you Thank here you. today. Uh, Fifty years ago, last February, uh, John Glenn made his famous orbital flight aboard Friendship 7 and became the third American and the fifth human being to venture into space. Uh, after that historic flight, Vice President Lyndon Johnson was on hand to greet him and called him a great pioneer of history. Uh, we are honored to have that great pioneer of history here at the LBJ Library. And we're honored not only to have Senator Glenn, but I also want to acknowledge that he brought his wife and partner of 69 years. They will be married 70 years as of April 6th of next year. Please welcome Annie Glenn as well. <laughs> Senator, I'd like to start with uh, something that I read in your memoir and found very interesting, and that is that you, there's an object on your desk that is always there, and it dates back to your childhood. It's your father's wrench. What is the significance <laughs> of that object to you? Well, before I answer that question, let me just yeah. thank Mike for his kind remarks, and Mike's been a good friend for a long time and really was instrumental in helping us start our School of Public Affairs up there, and uh, that's when he was in the, uh, working out of the National Archives in Washington and uh, became a good friend and is on our, our board of advisors up there still. And he's right that when we looked at, at how we were going to set up our, our school up there or an institute it was when it started out, uh, this was the first place we came was down here to see what had happened here and then on out to Stanford to look at the Haas school out there and so on. So uh, Mike's been a good friend and, and we, I don't think we would have the school up there the way it is and develop the way it is without Mike's help. So I wanted to, I'll give him a big hand myself. That's right. Us out. <laughs> Richly deserved. Thank you. And uh, so it's a pleasure to be back here again. Andy and I have spent uh, more time here in Texas uh, being stationed down at the Space Center and then previously when I was, went through flight training and, and then was later an instructor down at uh, Corpus Christi Naval Air, Naval Air Flight Training down there. So we spend a lot of time in Texas. Feels like uh, coming home to some extent. So I'm sorry to not answer your question directly. Oh, welcome home. <laughs> now if you repeat the question. <laughs> Happily. Uh, I, I was interested to read in your memoir that yeah. your father's wrench yeah, is wrench. always on your desk. It is. What is the significance of that? Well, it's a little, it's a, a little Stilson pipe wrench about that long. And um, my dad was a plumber and had a, a, a little plumbing shop in the small town. He was the, the town plumber and did new houses and so on when they were built. But uh, he worked very hard and it was tough work. And uh, my first job when I was a, a teenager and along in high school was in, during vacation periods or time periods I'd be working with him. And that was hard work, digging septic tank holes. Or, and uh, I hated every minute of it. But that's <laughs> But uh, I, when, when, after my dad had died and we were closing out some of the affairs and, and uh, getting rid of some of his equipment, uh, I had that and I, I thought I'd just keep that little wrench as a reminder that uh, that's my heritage, the hard work that he did along with a lot of other people. And so I have, I've kept that on, I had it on my desk in, in Washington when I was in the Senate and I still have it at home now. And it just is a reminder to me of, of uh, some of my own roots. Where did you get your love of flying? Flying was, it became, uh, my dad and I, when I was about eight or maybe nine, I think about eight years old, 
We drove by a little field where the fellow was taking people up for rides in an old two and open cockpit, two wing airplane. And uh, my dad wanted to know, did I want to go up? Well, of course I did. And so he and I went up in that open cockpit with one, one seat belt over both of us uh, sitting there and uh, flew around about 15 minutes or so. And, and it was just fascinating to me to look down and, and see the cars and people so small down below and uh, be able to look way out. And, and it was something that uh, uh, we didn't have a whole lot of money, of course, but uh, after that, I always built model airplanes and flew them, the old rubber band wind-up models, and not the kind you, the, the airplanes you snap together now, but the old balsa ones where you really had to right. cut out the little pieces and put them together. And uh, you could actually learn a little bit about flying and about airplanes from that, because we flew them and they'd crash and you'd put them back together again. But the, uh, uh, but then later when I was in college in the middle of my junior year, uh, the, there was a, a notice on the physics bulletin board that the government had a program called Civilian Pilot Training, CPT, and you could take that course and get a private pilot's license and get physics credit for it in college. And I thought it died and gone to heaven. That was, <laughs> that was great. And so I took that, and uh, that was in the spring of 41. And uh, Annie was a, uh, she was a music major and big pipe organ, was very good at it. And the afternoon, the Sunday afternoon, when she was having her organ recital in the, in the chapel at the Muskingum College where we grew up, uh, in driving up to go to her uh, recital, I heard on the car radio about Pearl Harbor and uh, didn't tell her about it till that evening. And then we decided that uh, I was in the middle of my junior year. And uh, since I had my private pilot's license and having gone through that CPT program, uh, I thought it was my duty to do what I could. So I left college in the middle of my junior year and went into military training and flying. And uh, once I got started, I loved it and uh, never went back. You were in World War II and then on the Korean, yeah. and then under the mm -hmm. Korean War. And uh, between the two, flew in almost 150 combat yeah. missions. Mm -hmm. And that led to your uh, being involved in the fledgling American space program. Now, yeah. how did that come about, Senator? Well, World War II was, uh, I was out in the islands for about a year there and, uh, and then was back out in the Korean War also. And the, uh, then out of that, <clears throat> by the time we got to the Korean War, we'd gotten to jet aircraft. And uh, the Navy and Marine Corps had a whole stable of new aircraft just being developed and just coming out and going into test. And I thought that'd be fascinating to be in, in test work and be able to improve airplanes and make them better for our country. And uh, so I applied for that and got that when I came back from the Korean War and went through uh, test pilot training then was on duty that in about three years doing test work on some of our new supersonic, air some of them supersonic airplanes, attack and fighter planes. So uh, it's a fascinating period because there was big advances being made in aviation and uh, it was a great time to be doing test work because not all the bugs had been worked out of some of these airplanes yet so we were doing a lot of good work. And uh, so then I had just left that at a time when the space program was just starting. And, the, uh, and so I, volu we volunteered, I volunteered for that and was accepted in that. And that was in, uh, that was in the, the, the fall of 1958 and beginning of 59. Uh, had you any idea when you entered the space program that it would become as big as it would become ultimately? No, we, we, the, I think people forget what the beginning of the space program really was, the manned program. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> The, uh, these were the depths of the Cold War. And uh, we were under competition. And the, uh, there was writing about was communism really the wave of the future in certain parts of the world and so on. It was being taken very seriously. And the Soviets at that time were uh, claiming technical and engineering superiority and technical superiority to the United States because their spacecraft had gone up and, and flown and too often ours were blowing up on the launch pad. And they were, they were using some of this to uh, attract young people in from all over the world, give them their education in, in the Soviet Union, and send them back out to their third world countries. And they were making a lot of, a lot of hay with this. And so that, those were really the, the early days of the space program uh, that Lyndon Johnson, in fact, played such a, a key part in. Because when we decided we were going to go ahead with a program, uh, it was sort of the, the 
the head of NASA was sort of selected by him, and I think the history books show the, the uh, very vital part that he played in, that, in the beginning of the space program. Jim Webb was select, right. selected as the uh, first head of, of Na the new NASA, uh, the National Aeronautics and Space, which replaced the old National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics, NACA, which had been in existence since, I guess, around the 1920s or 1919, something like that. So, uh, but this was a competition with the Soviets, and that's the, the impetus for it and the, uh, the drive to get it going and, and, and get going and get caught up was something we all felt then, and it's one reason why we had such great uh, congressional support for it, I think. We have in back of us uh, a photograph of you with your six original seven colleagues in the Mercury <laughs> program, and you've described that group as an elite group and an exclusive fraternity. What was it like to be in that very small group of? Well, it was, it, we'd all been selected, and there'd been, uh, I think, uh, President Eisenhower actually made the decision that, in, well, the first proposal had been that we would, that they would select, uh, they're gonna select, say, we're gonna select astronauts. Well, who are you gonna say? Daredevils, parachutists, uh, uh, evil Knievel type people who are gonna <laughs> jump cars and, and underwater, uh, people, submarine, all, all sorts of things were suggested. And Eisenhower is one who, as I understand it, or the record shows, I think, actually made the decision that he won military test pilots, and that was it. He figured we were accustomed more than anybody else to high speeds and, and uh, military background that uh, he thought was valuable. And so he's the one that made that, that uh, decision. But then out of that, then there were the uh, NASA set up the qualification things, and you had to be under 5'11 at that time, which I make by about an eighth of an inch all the time. <laughs> and uh, every time they would measure us in the space program, I'd stand up very tall and then just let it relax <laughs> a little bit <laughs> to make sure I still qualified. But uh, you had to be under 5'11 college degree and, and uh, uh, test flying experience and, and things like that. And so uh, there were about 100, they dropped out all the records of the people that had been through test pilot training and I think there were about 130 some, and then through a process of, of uh, screening and all, they worked it down to where the seven of us. Well, first off, there, there had been, a, I think, maybe 160 or so that actually were qualified, but there were about 30 or 40 there that did not want to continue being considered. They want to continue with their careers the way they were. And so we, uh, then they, they uh, started with this 130, whatever it was, and worked it down, and the seven were selected, and we were announced in, uh, in April of 59. Was it a competitive environment? I mean, yeah. you're, you're... Oh yeah, we were all competitive as can be. You never saw seven more competitive guys in your life at one. <laughs> but we were, it was a group, and we were proud of being in a group, and proud of each other in the group. Right. But it was competitive, because we all wanted to be on those first flights. And so it was a very competitive group. And, and uh, But when it came, some, once somebody was selected, everybody then just did their job, and that was it. The first flight, uh, Alan Shepard took the first flight. Al did the suborbital and flight Gus and down, yeah. Uh, another suborbital those, flight, yeah. and then you did the orbital flight. Yeah. Did you expect to be the first, Senator? No. Well, I wanted to be first in everything. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'd like to have made the first up, and I'd like to have made the first orbital, too, but that wasn't, that wasn't the way the program worked. But uh, no, the uh, people say, well, how were you selected? I, don't, I really do not know because uh, Bob Gilruth, who was directing the program then, the uh, uh, main program, he called in the people that were doing our training and the, the uh, physical trainers and everybody else. And then he made the decision, and uh, he made all the decisions in those early selections. So uh, that's been a long time ago now. There are only two of us left. Scott Carpenter is still alive, and uh, we've lost all the others here, so it's a, uh, I guess that points out our mortality eventually, but uh, it's been, uh, it, it, it was a, some experience back then that I think people forget came about because of competition with the Russians, and that was the big drive of the Soviets, and that was the big drive for it at that time. Sure. And that's the reason we all wanted to get going and, and be on every flight and uh, do what you could do. Lynn and Nugent and I were talking backstage about the fact that tomorrow is Halloween, and when we were kids, every boy we knew, and some girls, mm -hmm. Uh, wanted to be an astronaut for Halloween, and not just any astronaut. We wanted to be John Glenn. <laughs> and uh, not with apologies to Wally Shira and Gordo Cooper, we, we wanted to be John Glenn. Um, but uh, I can understand that. Yeah. <laughs>
<laughs> Were you prepared for the fame that, that came upon you as an astronaut? No, I don't think anybody could be prepared for that. Uh, we, had, uh, we knew that there was going to be a lot of attention on the flight, but uh, I don't think that the, the way the country picked up on this and the outpouring of, of feeling that came from those early flights, I don't think uh, none of us could have anticipated that. And uh, it was a surprise, and, and uh, we knew there was going to be attention. But this, the extreme outpouring of attention at that time and some of those things during a ticker tape parade, uh, uh, you know, and you look over and you see very tough uh, uh, construction people, New York, for instance, uh, on the building up there, wiping tears. Uh, you know, things, uh, it was quite moving. Uh, my, my, I, my son and I rented uh, the right stuff to, so I could give him a sense of things. I know that's wholly inaccurate, but there's one scene in there that is memorable, and that's all the astronauts were at a, a reception, and one Texan comes up to uh, Alan Shepard, and he says, which one are you? And he says, Alan Shepard, and he says, oh, where's John Glenn? <laughs> <laughs> well, the movie I recommend is Apollo 13. Right. I know the right stuff. The right stuff was written about us, but I, I uh, with all due respect, uh, Tom Wolfe's book I thought was pretty good. I like it. It's sort of stream of consciousness type right. writing, which I like. And uh, but when Hollywood got hold of it, they hammed it up so badly that I didn't uh, didn't go for the movie. Yeah. It, it's it's okay as entertainment, but they advertised it as being a, almost a documentary of the early space days, and it was anything but that. Right. But but the Apollo 13, where Jim Lovell, who was a neighbor of ours down there, got when Jim got in trouble on that. That was uh, the way they portrayed that in Apollo 13. That's exactly the way it happened. Mm -hmm. And so I, re I always recommend that movie if people want to see a good space movie. One of the most anxious moments during your, your Friendship 7 flight was your re-entry into Earth's mm -hmm. atmosphere and the, the fly-by wire mm -hmm. re-entry. Senator, can you talk about that and how it came about? Well, the, the uh, We'd had some troubles with the automatic control system on the flight that one of the little uh, thrusters to the outside stuck and was wasting the peroxide. And uh, so it meant that I was going to have to cut the flight short and come back in if we didn't stop that. So I just pulled, turned the thing off and, uh, and went to manual control. Uh, the plan had been to let it be on full automatic control for the first orbit and a half about and then try out uh, these different systems, roll, pitch, and yaw. Uh, one at a time and then combine the two to see whether you can control it because there were some of the, you know, back in those days there were, there were things that we didn't, a lot of things we didn't know what we could do and could not do. And uh, that was one of them. Could you relate to looking outside through the little, little window here and, and actually control a three-axis hand control? It didn't have rudder pedals like an airplane. We did that yaw control, which a rudder pedals do by twisting this way, and, and pitch was this way, and, and uh, roll was this. And so we had practiced all this a lot, and, but you still had to prove that you could do this in space and, and orient the space program, uh, spacecraft the way you wanted. Uh, we all had a lot of faith that we'd be able to do this, but it's still something that hadn't been done before. And so uh, when the, uh, the automatic system failed, instead of going one axis at a time, I just cut them all off and, and uh, and went to manual control, and that worked okay. And I stayed on that then for the rest of the flight to, until I got ready for re-entry. Now, what you're talking about, those where the automatic system right. uh, was supposed to be used for re-entry. And there was a, a uh, there had been a, uh, we don't have a spacecraft here that uses a model, but there was a different problem on re-entry that made it uh, very in interesting to say the least. If you're re-entering, and this is a spacecraft coming in this way, and you have the heat shield under here, and on that heat shield then are your three retro rockets, which as you're in orbit coming around, they fire to slow you down enough so that your, your trajectory starts coming down into the upper parts of the atmosphere and slows you down and down you come. Well, there had been a, a uh, and, and normally then, here you come down in the, uh, you fire these retro rockets and normally, they are ejected into space, and then you make a re-entry then coming down like this with the small part of the spacecraft back here. Coming down then with the heat shield ahead of you, and it then takes care of all of the uh, high heat, about 3,000 degrees on the, on the face of the heat shield. The, uh, 
what happened was that there was, and, and then when you come down and are, are getting down lower, when the, when the chutes come out down low, uh, then you uh, you could uh, you don't have that you don't have the retro pack on. Ordinarily, when you fire the retro pack, it is ejected, and you enter with a clean heat shield. Well, and then when you come down on the main parachute, there are latches pull, and that whole heat shield drops about four feet down, and it's like a rubber bag, so you're landing then on an, uh, like on an air pillow. And the, the indicator, there were two ground stations received radio signals uh, from the spacecraft that that, uh, that latch pulling had already occurred in space which meant then if you're coming back in and the, the heat shield is just flopping around out here, the whole thing's going to burn up probably. So what they decided to do and what they recommended, which I did, was was make a re-entry uh, after firing the retro rockets to slow down, uh, made the decision to leave those retro rockets in place because they were attached onto the spacecraft with some metal straps in the hopes that that... Uh, retro pack being on there would help hold the heat shield in place until we got through the high heat of, of re-entry. Well, uh, and so that's what we did, left it on. Well, it made for a very unusual re-entry in that uh, during re-entry when you got high heat, the retro pack then burned off and there were big chunks of, uh, and you're going this direction if I was in the spacecraft right now. So you're looking back along the track from which you just came and there were chunks of this burning off and coming around and I could see them out the window here. And that was uh, uh, interesting, to say the least. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, uh, anyway, it was a. Uh, uh, it made for a very spectacular reentry from where I was, and it, it uh, won't be repeated because we don't use that same kind of of reentry technique now. But it was. Uh, that's a long explanation of your short question here. But there, I should have brought along a, a, a model, I guess, so we could e explain that better. But. Uh, uh, anyway, the, the automatic control system, when we, it came time for re-entry, uh, I turned it on and the manual system both on. I had everything working uh, during re-entry to, to take care of the vibrations and the, uh, the rocking back and forth of the spacecraft during re-entry. Well, 36 years after your historic friendship, seventh flight, uh, you went back into space and became mm -hmm. the oldest human being to do so at the age of 77. You have uh, to keep bringing that up. <laughs> <laughs> uh, as part of the uh, space me, shuttle. Uh, sure. I'm going to use this as one uh, entree and segue into this. I just thought you'd be interested in this. I received a letter from a boy in Illinois. This is an actual letter. I'm not making it up. It's true. And uh, here's what he, he told me. And he writes this and he says, hi, I'm so-and-so and I'm nine years old. I'm in the third grade in such and such a school. I wish you'd come just recently. I had to do a biography report and I picked you because I wanted to learn more about the first American to orbit Earth. I loved reading about your life. When I had to do my presentation, I made a poster and dressed up like an astronaut. Then he asks a couple more questions. Then he finishes with this. I'm glad you're still alive because a lot of my classmates' biography choices are already dead. I, I hope you write back. <laughs> That kid got the fastest answer back you ever got. <laughs> now I lost my whole train of thought. Not at all. <laughs> what led you going back into space at the tender age of 77? Uh, well, two things really. One, uh, I was in the Senate, of course, and, and uh, during preparation for one of the uh, votes on some of the the uh, astronaut, uh, the uh, space budget, we had a, uh, I noted that NASA had charted some 52 changes in the human body that occur in space on the, if you're up there for a number of days. And uh, there were about eight or nine of these things were very similar to the process of aging right here on Earth. And uh, for instance, the body's immune system changes in space. Well, it, it become, you become less resistant to disease and infection up there for a while, and you recover from that when you come back. Uh, but that happens to the older folks, right? Most older folks right here on Earth. Uh, the body's uh, ability to replace protein in the muscles uh, changes up there, and the changes for old folks right here on Earth, some other things like that too. 
So the idea was that they, they uh, if we went up there, if, if sent somebody up there that uh, was already, say, 75 to 80 in that age range, uh, that these things had already happened to here on Earth, would this be additive? Or could we, by comparing uh, the reaction of the older person with the younger crew members, uh, maybe come up with something, uh, some lead to what changes these, what turns these systems on and off in the human body, uh, and maybe lead us to not only being able to have younger astronauts stay in space longer without harmful effects, uh, or it might also enable us to learn some things about taking away some of the frailties of old age right here on Earth. So that was fascinating, and I talked to some of the NASA doctors about it, and they, uh, uh, they had been thinking about looking into some of this, it turns out, for some time. And uh, so I uh, proposed that uh, we do such a project, and that uh, also proposed that I be the one to do it. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, of course, Dan Golden, who was the, uh, uh, the director of NASA, at that, administrator of NASA at that time, said I'd, that I'd get no freebies on, uh, on waivers on physical exams or anything like that. And so I was able to pass a physical exam, and so that was that. But, uh, and we, uh, so we, we had uh, experiments we did up there while I was up there. I had uh, 21 different body parameters, head, net, and spandex vest for uh, respiration uh, rate and volume, and, and uh, EKG being monitored, sent down for four days with all that rig on. And, uh, I wish I could say that we, we had made some great breakthrough discovery. We didn't, uh, but I, I still hope that they go ahead, and I've talked to NASA about this, about uh, continuing some of these experiments, because you know in science, an example of one doesn't mean anything. It mean, N equals one in your typical scientific jargon. But uh, uh, if we had a, a, say, five or six people in this same age bracket that had been up there, uh, then we know either that's something, that, that's enough data then that you know there's no, no use to follow that, or it gives us some lead to continue. Right. And so that's what I hope we do one of these days. So uh, now the other reason for going back up again was uh, the, uh, after my first flight in 62, and this, this sounds very unhumble, and maybe it is, but it's, it's what's in the books anyway. Uh, I wanted to go back up again, second time, wanted to get in rotation and, and go back up again. And uh, they said, no, they didn't want me on rotation again, and, and uh, wanted me to do some management of training and things, which I didn't much want to do. And uh, this went on for about a year and a half that I wasn't being put back on again. I kept asking about it. And uh, they kept saying, well, headquarters doesn't want you to go up again right now. And so finally, I, I gathered I wasn't going to fly again then and, and always wanted to go up again. And uh, later on in a biography of uh, President Kennedy, uh, this came many years later. This was a, a I don't know, a decade or more later. Uh, there was a, a biography came out in which uh, they said that he had uh, didn't want me to go up again at that time. I don't know whether it be if something happened, whether it be the political fallout from it or, or what. But he had told Nancy just soon I, I wasn't used again right then, and I didn't know that at the time. It was because and, you were a national hero, and he didn't well, want to. Uh, whatever I was, anyway. But, but, but anyway. But, <laughs> The, but that was the reason for it. So I had always wanted to go up again. I was sorry I didn't get a second flight. Yeah. And uh, actually, I'd like to have been on one of the moon flights, but that's the, uh, I told Neil, Neil's a good friend. Of course, he died a short time ago. He was a big loss. But uh, I told Neil, I'm not given to fits of, of uh, jealousy of anybody, but for him, I'll make an exception. <laughs> <laughs> we. Uh... Uh, we, we hear constantly about our mounting federal deficit, but given our financial constraints, what should our goals in space be at this time in our history? Well, I, we're not at a very good time period right now in, in our uh, space program because, I don't know if most people know this or not, but we can't even send, a, a, we, can't, we don't have any way of sending our own people up to our own space station right now. We have to contract with the, with the uh, uh, Russians and we send our people over and they're launched out of Kazakhstan and, and uh, go up to our, we pay them $60 million per astronaut to go up to the station and bring them back down again after they've been, whatever their term is up there, because of the decision to uh, do away with the space shuttle. And I disagreed with that. I think it was a mistake. And it was a, uh, uh, didn't have happen back in, in 04. And uh, 
President Bush decided that he wanted to change the direction of NASA and made a speech in, in January of 04 to do exactly that and they're going to establish a base on the moon, but uh, said at the same time we're not going to, uh, and NASA was not going to have an increased budget to do this. Well, that's a, a little flaky to begin with, I thought. But uh, anyway, this was a, uh, uh, NASA had to do this out of their current budget, and to do this, he said that we're going to end the space shuttle at the end of 2010 and end the space station by 2015. And the, uh, the, space, uh, the space shuttle, they're expensive. Each flight was running about $400 million, so it's a way to save money. But I think to set a new goal like that and then uh, cut out our own, or the only means we had of getting our own astronauts into space uh, in what I think is the most wonderful transportation system ever put together in that shuttle. It's, it's just an amazing amount of complexity and technology in it. Uh, and I hate to see us do away with that, but that was a decision that was made, and the shuttle went down in 2010, so we have to launch our people with the uh, Russians now. And uh, the uh, uh, Constellation was canceled by President Obama then later on, uh, and went to this private uh, idea of private uh, industry uh, competing then to design the new spacecraft. Uh, I met with President Obama in uh, the summer of 2010, I guess it was, and tried to get him to reverse the shuttle thing. I thought that we should have a replacement for the shuttle before we do away with it. Right. And uh, But he said, well, we were, that was when we were in the middle of some of the uh, recession crunch, and he said we just, he much as he was, he didn't disagree with my rationale for it at all, he just uh, said we didn't have the money to do it. So that's where we stand right now. So we're, we're in the process, we have major, three different contractors that are, are privately developing spacecraft. Uh, SpaceX, that has made several launches right. recently uh, with success, is one of them. Uh, the uh, uh, Sierra Nevada is another one that's uh, working on that. Right. And uh, Steve Lindsay, our good friend from that uh, flight, is up there running their flight operations on that now out in, uh, in Colorado. Right. And he'll do a good job on that, of course. And uh, so they're going to be competitive in there. And, and, and there's one other, uh, Boeing, I think, is still looking at this also. So we'll have out of that uh, private effort, we will have somebody who will finally provide the spacecraft that we'll be able now to go back and forth to our station. to the station. The station has been, uh, Obama did extend the station out to 2020 at least, and uh, talks are underway to extend it to sort of an indefinite period beyond that. Right. And I think that's very important because the, uh, it, it's, it's the most unique laboratory ever put together. We can do the most unique research there. And we don't know exactly what the, we may find out of that, but it's a, uh, it's uh, the, the uh, Ability to do basic research is so important to this country in keeping us ahead of the rest of the world. And to me, this is sort of the epitome of what we can do in, 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 uh, with spacecraft. And uh, people say, well, what good is it going to be? Well, I don't, who knows? That's what research is all about. Uh, reminded the old what, uh, Disraeli, the British prime minister, was visiting a laboratory where Faraday had developed bottles with sparks that would jump from one to the other, and he said, what good is it? And Faraday replied, what good is a baby? That's the story, the story is told. I wasn't there. I'm not quite that old. But, but, but it, it's an example anyway of, uh, what do you know about research? Well, we know that if we know one thing about this country, it's that we, we, we were founded with a, a, an emphasis on the individual that led us to give more education to more people and wound up with the best educated citizenry. Yeah. And then we, we had put more money into basic research and exploration in the laboratory, micro as well as macro, the big exploration to the West Coast and all, but, uh, but micro exploration in the laboratory as well. And that we learned the new things first and with an educated citizenry and a little bit of investment. And wow, we just, we, we went from being a nothing nation on the East Coast in uh, along about 1776 to by 1900, 125 years later, we're leading the world. And I, I think that little formula is every bit as important today as it's been any time in our history. And uh, so that's, that's a shorthand for why I support the space 
station as much as I do and work for it while I was in the Senate. Well, I want to talk about your years in the Senate, but before I, I leave your aviation days, I was interested to read in your memoir that uh, you had occasion to be Charles Lindbergh, who you called every pilot's hero, and you said you, you felt a certain kinship with him. Can you yeah. talk about that meeting? Well, yeah, in World War II, the old, uh, we were flying the, the uh, Corsair, the old inverted gull wing uh, Navy and Marine Corps fighter. And it had a lot of problems starting out. And the Navy had to take it off ship and it, it had some changes made to it. Well, Lindbergh by that time was working for uh, United Aircraft, I think it was, up in, uh, in uh, New England. And then he was, he was flying, doing some of the flying on checking out some of these things on the Corsair. And he made the rounds of a number of squadrons then flying this airplane around the country to different squadrons to show the, the changes that had been made and how good they were and how they worked. And uh, we were training in uh, El Centro, California at the Marine Corps Air Station there at the time. And he came, stopped there and, and uh, several of us were able to fly his airplane, the new airplane. Well, then later on, I was in a squadron out in the Pacific in the islands, and he came out there later on and actually flew some missions with uh, some. He flew a couple of missions out of the squadron I was in, so I didn't get to know him well, but I, I did uh, have a chance to meet him anyway. Lindbergh at Glenn, sort of captures the imagination, doesn't <laughs> uh, You entered into public service in 1974 as a U.S. senator mm -hmm. from your native state of Ohio. Um, why did you choose to go into public service? I guess it started back in high school. I had a, a, uh, a teacher in high school who uh, taught a course called Civics, and it was a study of government and politics. And I guess growing up in a small Midwestern town, uh, it was sort of a, you were just expected to be patriotic as far as that part of it went. But uh, this course in civics, he was a wonderful teacher and he had a lot of examples and things and he just made this study of civics and, and government come, sort of come alive with examples of people and, and so on. And I always thought after he took his course that one of the greatest things you could ever do would be to, to represent other people in public office. And I had no idea I'd ever be able to do that. But uh, later on after then when I was leaving NASA after the uh, uh, space flight and uh, thought about uh, what I wanted to do, why I decided maybe I, if my name was well enough known, maybe I could uh, do that. And it wasn't something I had ever really uh, thought that I would be able to do. And uh, so I, I ran and, uh, and lost first time. I lost in the primary. 1964. 1964, and I, I lost in the primary, and uh, then Andy and I had to sit down and decide, did we really want to continue with this, because I'd, I'd had a business connection at that time I was involved with. And uh, so uh, we decided that uh, the, uh, I, I hadn't been the person I was running against at that time and, and lost in the primary. Uh, he'd been very active in the Democratic Party in Ohio and had contributed money to a number of different places. And, and it was a, uh, uh, and so it was uh, something I'm not making excuses for having lost. I lost and that was it, but it was a narrow, lost by only 13,000 votes in Ohio, which was a pretty tight race. And uh, we decided that uh, we would stick with this. And so for the next four years, I made the rounds of every rubber chicken dinner <laughs> in 22 caliber peas uh, in Ohio. <laughs> and and uh, not that the Democrats don't eat well, don't, don't we do but uh, made the rounds and then uh, the next time I made it and then was in the Senate for 24 years. Uh, the Senator spoke to a number of students at the LBJ School of Public Affairs today. And Senator, when you were there, you told a very moving story uh, about Daniel Anyway, which mm -hmm. really reflects the differences between Washington when you first entered into politics uh, and yeah. Washington today. Would you mind relating that story? Yeah, well, I was talking, we were talking about the civility in government and uh, what's happened to us. And, and I think part of the problem is just that we've gotten so unsocial in Washington by the requirements of getting back home to campaign. And so you only really are in there voting maybe three days a week or something like that. And, and the other days you may be in session, but no, everybody knows there's not gonna be any votes on those days. And so it's, and there's a lot less of the social life, I think, than there used to be. And some of this is also because of the extreme amount of money it has to be raised to run. So the day people are elected, they start running for office 
again and raising money again. And so just there isn't the same type social thing. And I, I used as an example of uh, one of the things that uh, Bob Byrd, who was majority leader for a long time in the U.S. Senate, and uh, Bob was somewhat of a controversial figure in, in his own regard, but uh, he started something that I think we ought to do again, and it was a, a uh, he had a, an evening where he invite all the senators, Republican, Democrat, everybody, and wives to a big dinner in the uh, Senate caucus room. And does he do this maybe every six weeks or eight weeks, something like that? And uh, you're supposed to mix it up. Don't sit at the table with somebody you knew. And so you get get acquainted with somebody else. And the uh, and there'd be some entertainment. Uh, the Republicans had these four senators that had gotten together, and they loved to do barbershop quartet type singing. And so they they and they weren't bad. They were pretty good. And so they'd uh, they performed a couple of times. And Bob Bird was a he'd been a championship fiddler in his younger days. People didn't know that. And uh, and he performed a couple of times. And uh, then one time was uh, Danny Inouye. Now, Danny Inouye is a senator from Hawaii. He was uh, in the, uh, uh, one of these Japanese battalions that was sent into Italy. He had an arm shot off. And uh, so when he was back, uh, and one day he, he had uh, uh, volunteered to be, to entertain at one of these things. And what do you want to do? We wanted to play the piano. When he's one-handed, and they said, "Danny, you can't you get that note." He wanted to play. Well, then he told this story about how, when he was at the uh, recovery in uh, the, for a year or so after he had the arm shot off, and they had crafts and things like that, and teach people to play instruments and so on. And he told him he wanted to play the piano. He said, "No, nah, Danny, you only got one." He said, "Nope, he wanted to play the piano. He always wanted to do that, and he was, he was one-handed." Well, then he. He, uh, and that night he told this story and then performed and played Oh Danny Boy. <laughs> and I'll tell you, uh, there wasn't a dry eye in the place. Well, it's just little things like that, little personal vignettes, relationships of people that I think we have to get back to. Not that, not that he has to perform all the time, I didn't mean that, but, <laughs> but uh, these, these things where you sort of have people know their personal experiences, you know their families better. Uh, I would like to see us, for instance, in Washington, this would be an upset, of course, but I'd like to see us have people voting from Monday morning at 9 o'clock to Friday afternoon at 5 o'clock and uh, straight through. And you're going to stay in Washington that period and go that way for a while and then maybe have two weeks off while people go home and campaign. And now they're running out of Washington back and forth all the time. There's very little socializing and and there's more to it than just socializing. It's the money that's involved and, and the Supreme Court ruling on this United decision that it's called last year, where now you can have, anybody can give any amount. And we have a, uh, uh, our Senate race in Ohio, Sherrod Brown, who's the incumbent senator, is being challenged now. And some of the big, the uh, uh, Karl Rove and some of his, the PAC there and the other, the Koch brothers and so on, uh, Sherrod, by election day, estimates that they will have spent $30 million against him in a Senate race. And it's higher by far than anything ever done anywhere in, in the United States, I think. So uh, we have to crack some of this money thing along with it to get back to civility in government. But I think some of this just uh, uh, having more of a social contact type thing, I think, would help also. Far more money will be spent in this year's presidential race. Yeah. You yourself ran for president in 1984. There's a picture of that behind You would us. have to bring that up. <laughs> <laughs> what did you learn from that experience? I learned not to do it the way I did it. <laughs> <laughs> no, and that's, a, that's not a very good joke either, but it's true. Uh, well, it's, a, it's an experience that you'll, uh, you, you never forget, that's for sure. It's a big effort. Yeah. And if I had it to do over again and, and was in that same position, I would, uh, uh, you know, they, they so much want you, you got to be out there. We got this event plan and so on and so on. And I, I didn't think things were going right, and I wanted to come off the road and reorganize. And if I had done that, I don't know that things would have worked out differently, but I think uh, it might have been a different approach to it. Right. But I was not that well organized for it. and. Uh, I still thought the ideas I had and what I was putting forward, I, I firmly believed in those things. But uh, the way the campaign was organized just didn't sit. And that was, uh, that was way back. That was in the, uh, 
uh, mid 1980s. Right. So it's a long time ago now. Uh, this presidential race will boil down to what happens in the battleground states, and perhaps yeah. the biggest battleground <laughs> is your home state of Ohio. Yeah. What will happen there, Senator? What will happen? <laughs> Not to put you on the spot. <laughs> But that's sort of the elephant uh, well, or the donkey I'll, I'll, in the no, room. I'll tell you what I, I tell a lot of other people. I think that uh, I think Ohio is going to go for Obama. I think it'll be tight. It, yeah. It'll be a tight race. Uh, he was up by about seven points on polling, and I think uh, it's running about four points now. But that's from a number of different polls, or about four points. And I, if I had to guess, I'd guess it would hold about that. Uh, I don't think we know what's going to happen now because of this hurricane up there where neither, where they're not out on the, able to go out and campaign. And I think Obama's doing exactly what he should do. He's got responsibilities as president in a situation like this. And he went back to Washington. That's what he's doing. And that's what he should do. Now, will this lose him votes? I, I, don't, I don't really know. But uh, uh, well, I guess we, all the reasons why I feel the way I do, I guess we'll leave out unless we give somebody equal time to come up. And <laughs> <laughs> You've known 10 presidents in your 50 years in the public eye, John F. Kennedy forward. Uh, are any of those men particularly memorable for you? Well, they're all memorable in their own way. We talk about and, them briefly. Uh, John F. Kennedy, what, what, what are your thoughts? Well, on I'm, I'm not, not going to get into an analysis of, <clears throat> of every president. But uh, Kennedy, very personable, had great ideas for the country, I think, and some of the things he was doing, as well as uh, trying to give everybody an equal opportunity, I think, were very good. And I think uh, that's, that's been key to me all, all through whoever I did know, was uh, uh, this country is founded on, on, the, on the opportunity we provide our people more than any nation in history. And uh, we can argue all day about whether some of it is, is uh, right politically or uh, is it, do we have too many social programs or what, what do we do there? Uh, I grew up in, Annie and I grew up in the Great Depression, so maybe I was, some, maybe some of my thinking got warped a little bit by that, but we were early teenagers in the Great Depression. And uh, our house at that time, our home uh, faced the old National Road, Route 40, that went clear, first road to go clear cross country. <clears throat> and it was not unusual at all uh, a number of times. I remember uh, people walking up and knocking on the front door and telling the mother they hadn't had anything to eat and they were hungry and wondered if she could give them something to eat. And she always would fix them a plate and they'd sit down on the back steps and, and eat and things like that. And, and uh, uh, you just uh, there were there were four years where unemployment was over 20 percent. One year it was right at 25 percent, and there just wasn't any <clears throat> money. Well, some of the programs were put in back then, government programs, did bring us out of that, and uh, didn't do it perfectly, and we're not coming back perfectly right now. Right. But uh, our problems are less than I think they were back then. So we've come through some of these big times in the past, and I think we'll. I think we'll uh, we learn better how to control some of these things, and and uh, those were those were tough days yeah. back then. And people, uh, I remember in, in Columbus, Ohio, where we have a home now and spend most of our time. Uh, I remember a, a uh, my dad and I drove to uh, we were up there one time, and I saw a line of people, and I sort of said something about, wonder what all that lineup is, and, and he said, oh, they're waiting to get something to eat at the soup kitchen. He knew where the thing was around there. So there was that kind of stuff going on in our own lives that we don't read about. We, we knew it. We lived it. Right. And, uh, and my dad had, uh, you know, had the plumbing shop. And uh, when he was out doing plumbing jobs, mother would be there and she'd tend the store where they had fixtures and all this kind of stuff for sale, too. But uh, then in, in the Great Depression, there wasn't any plumbing work. Who, who was going to pay to have a drain unplugged or nobody was building new homes? And uh, my dad actually went to work on WPA. They're putting a new, new uh, w, one of the WPA projects was to do, put a new water system in our little town. And uh, my dad wound up going on WPA. And, and the, one of the things at that time that uh, I remember one of the most disturbing conversations I ever heard between my dad and mother was uh, 
uh, my dad saying he thought that we didn't have money to pay the uh, mortgage and we're going to lose the home. And I, I knew some other kids who had had that happen to them. And I couldn't imagine where we're going, whether they're going to split up the family, we're going to do this, going to do that. And uh, boy, that was horrifying. And uh, when WPA came in, well, and then FHA came in, they could, could make longer loans and stretch the loans out, and that saved our house. So does government have a role in these things? Yes, I don't, I don't buy this thing that the government should, uh, that defense is the only thing the government should do. I think that the, uh, and support for, for most of the social programs, not all of them, but most of the social programs, the support has been pretty much across the board for, for expenditures that were gonna be for everybody's good. Right. And uh, it was uh, uh, President Eisenhower, one of his great legacies that he was criticized some for at the time and had to really make a sales program on was, of all things, the interstate highway system. And he finally, he thought that was a great idea for the country and he finally sold the idea and got it through on the basis it was good for defense, that if we ever were attacked in this country, we'd be able to shuffle trucks and things around all over the place. Well, it's revolutionized this country and it was a government thing that did it. And should we have left that to the states? That's what. Some of the people argued at the time, no, I don't think so. And I'm not, I'm not for developing a socialized society, but my, my judgment when I was in the Senate was always based on this. If we have a problem that everybody in the country faces together, can we then devise a solution to help those concerns since all people face this whole thing together? Right. And that to me is sort of the judgment of whether we, uh, we should have federal programs versus letting the states do their own thing. And that's, uh, that's one of the big arguments this time, of course. You've, been, you've spent the last 15 years encouraging young folks to get mm -hmm. in, active in public service through, as, as Mike mentioned, the John Glenn School of Public Affairs at, yeah. at Ohio State University. Tell us about the work that you're doing there. Well, we're doing it. It's uh, worked out very well. Uh, uh, one of the other things I should have mentioned just a moment ago, Lyndon Johnson's Great Society, where he has sure. really some great, and it came from some of his own experiences when he was a kid right where we are now, in this general area here in Texas. So uh, anyway, the uh, Glenn School up there, Mike, uh, Mike Gillette, when he was in the archives up there and I was leaving the Senate, uh, after looking around, recommended that we put all of our records and things back there at Ohio State where they had a good uh, archival facility. And uh, they were interested in starting a, a Glenn Institute of Public Affairs, which I was very interested in doing too. Uh, when I retired from the Senate, I didn't want to retire, retire, and go sit on the front porch someplace. We wanted to uh, do some, continue doing some good if we could. And uh, so through that, we had the, uh, through putting the things, our, our artifacts and things up there that uh, that they can use for uh, either all, all, all the Senate records they use for some sort of study of what a Senate office was like during that period I was in there. And they have that organized now and they're computerizing it uh, so that it'd be available to people that want to do any research on something like that. And the, uh, but the uh, school then was an institute and uh, it gradually has now changed into, uh, through some acquisitions and so on, it's now a full-fledged school of public affairs with an undergrad program and a master's program and doctoral program. And uh, the forecasts were that it was, by this time we'd be fortunate if we had a, a grand total in this thing of, oh, 175 to 200 people and we're already over 500. Wow. So it's going well. That's great. And uh, like everything else, what we need is, uh, is money to expand, but uh, it's doing well. And uh, we are, are uh, in the process of the, uh, person that's been directing it up there is, is retiring, so we're in the process of uh, searching for a new, or going to start a search committee for a new director very shortly. And uh, I hope that we not only go, we've gone in the 240 some schools of public affairs around the country, uh, we've moved up to where we're about 20 listed by U.S. News and some of those people as listing us as about 29 in this uh, area of excellence. So we're building fast and, and getting a good, uh, a good faculty and, and we look forward to this and I hope we can uh, branch out and do some things in this civics area back into the high schools where I got my interest to begin with that we mentioned a while ago. I was interested in seeing in, I don't know how many of you get Parade Magazine in the Sunday Supplement <coughs> occasionally, but 
in the September 30th issue was recounting what Sandra Day O'Connor, former Supreme Court Justice, has done. Right. And uh, it was a very interesting because it's something I had talked about some of in Ohio is, is uh, she's got a real outreach program and it's computerized and it uh, attracts, is it, it's built, uh, I think Baylor helped her design this thing. And uh, the, uh, uh, they have it designed for the kids' interest now where the kids are all going around tweeting, blogging, tweetering, twattering, twill, whatever they <laughs> do to each other. And if they, uh, uh, it's designed for the kids that are used to punching a button and seeing something come up. And it's, it's all designed for the different age groups and it's, it's very interesting. And uh, I hope that uh, in the near future we may be able to combine forces with what she's doing and do some things like that in Ohio and maybe expand it to other states too. She was in this very auditorium and did that, that, that civics program just about a year ago. Really? She was. Yeah. I hadn't been aware of it. I don't think the thing has been very well publicized, and I was glad to see this thing in Parade Magazine because it's exactly what we talked about up there. And, uh, because, and the reason I, I feel strongly about it is I think, I think most kids, as they uh, come out of grade school, that's sort of a insular type thing, I guess. And uh, when they get to, to junior high or high school, that's where kids' interests are. Hey, there's a big world out there, and they really suddenly realize they're a part of it. And I think it's where their interest maybe in, uh, in government and politics can be whetted a little bit or can be encouraged at that level more than it can maybe at the college or university level. I think by the time most kids get to college or university, they sort of have, they may sort of have their ideas sort of made up about their relationship to their country. And, and if, we can, uh, if we can help uh, influence that at an earlier age, I, and uh, I think that's well worthwhile. Senator uh, Lyndon Nugent put it aptly, you are indeed an American hero. We, we mm -hmm. are grateful for you being here tonight. Thank you so much. Well, thank you all. Thank you.